Andrew, thank you very much indeed, and uh, my thanks to uh, both Reform and Barclays for giving us this opportunity to speak about welfare reform, as I said earlier on a lovely summer's day. Well, it was, wasn't it, two days ago, but that perhaps was summer. Anyway, it's a huge pleasure to be here. Um, today, I thought it would be very useful to set out uh, our reforms of the last five years have taken us, where we've gone, <clears throat> as a backdrop, and then to set the priorities, I think, for the next five years and focus particularly in on uh, ESA. So let me start very quickly with the last parliament. Uh, it was very clear when we arrived in 2010 that something had gone very wrong uh, in the country. We had a welfare system where life on benefits seemed to be paying often more than it was to have a job. And that wasn't fair, I don't think, and didn't think at the time to hardworking taxpayers uh, who paid for that. And it wasn't fair, I also think, more importantly perhaps, to those who were trapped in a system with no hope of any kind of brighter future. Uh, so we were living in a country, intriguingly, where something in the order of one in five households had nobody working. The number of households where no one had ever worked had nearly doubled. Uh, 1.4 million people had been on benefits for most of the previous decade, and where close to half of all households in the social rented sector had nobody in work at all. And so that was a pretty bleak picture, and it was uh, the reality, really, in a sense, some five-plus years ago. So under the last Labour government, welfare spending went up over 60%, and the benefit systems cost nearly every household an extra £3,000 a year. Spending on tax credits increased by 335% at some £23 billion. So it's clear uh, that that approach of the last government to parceling out and handing out money to lift people over an arbitrary poverty line didn't seem to be working. And of course, money has and is a vital, important role to play. But greater and greater money handouts are not exactly the way of extending opportunity. They weren't actually transforming the lives in any particular way, and they failed to improve those life chances. The government spending was uh, poorly targeted, and there was a focus on inputs rather than outcomes. And the result, I felt, was a country where worklessness had become ingrained in certain communities. A life without work for many had become the norm. It was taking root in families and starting to pass through to the next generation. So this really, in a sense, should have been seen as a kind of national scandal, one for which we're all responsible. And above all, a personal tragedy for each and every person, uh, their family, when they were not in work. So the sick benefit culture in this country, I believe, is part of that and is in need of dire reform. So it will be my focus in the coming months, and I want to be clear about the principles that will drive <coughs> these changes and actions as we move forward. I've said many times that I believe work is the best route out of poverty. It provides purpose, responsibility, and role models for children. And as one nation government, we believe everyone in this country should have the chance to benefit uh, from uh, the security and sense of purpose that comes with being in work. That is why our guiding principle has been to place work at the heart uh, of everything that we do with our reforms. Getting people into work is more, and I stress this, it's more than just earning a salary and certainly more than balancing the public purse. These matter, of course, but they are not the primary reasons. For culturally and socially, work is the spine that runs through a stable society. We could not have continued with the situation where we were left in 2010. Significant numbers of people saw work as something completely alien to them and their families. And for many, work was something that they simply didn't do and never had. It was something other people did. Many had fallen into a life of dependency, which is damaging in a sense for the wider society as well. For a dependent society is one that is more likely to suffer crime, more likely to be ill, more likely to call on the health service, and more likely to increase the cost to the criminal justice system. But critically, families where no one works lose their sense of self-worth. Children grow up without the aspiration to achieve, and they become almost certain to repeat the difficulties of their parents, following a path from dependency through eventually to despondency. I want those who remain trapped and isolated on welfare to move from dependence to independence. 
And that, in my mind, is real social justice, giving people the power to decide their own lives, uh, not live a life dictated to by others, people like me. And that's why we're helping people and want to help more back to work and into staying in work. So let's just look very quickly at a couple of the programs. The work program is, I believe, the most successful back to work program that we've ever seen. By March this year, over a million people, or 70% of all referrals, had spent some time off benefits. And over 430,000 people had moved into lasting employment. Job centers were also now working in a more flexible way, providing longer term support. And it's worth remembering about the work program, too, that it is the first time that we track people in the amount of time that they stay in work, not just get a job, but how long do they stay there, uh, and therefore what is their general outcome. And the job centers are reacting to that as well. And we're now rolling our universal credit and our fit for work service, something I'm going to come back to in a second. But we can see the change that has been made since 2010. Some two million more people are in work. The number of workless households has reached a record low, down over 670,000. And the workless households rate in the social rented sector is now at the lowest level on record. But that's all very well and good. But we know we must not stop there. We need to be relentless in our effort to get more people off welfare and into work. But work is more than just salaries, tax, numbers and statistics. It's what shapes us, it's what helps us to develop. In short, it's about self-esteem, self-confidence, self-worth. Yet there is one more area where we haven't focused on enough. How work is also good for your health. Growing evidence over the last decade has shown work can keep people healthy as well as help promote recovery if someone falls ill. By contrast, there is a strong link between those not in work and also poor health. So it is right that we look at how the system supports people who are sick and then also helps them into work. So let me be clear, though, as the backstop to all of this. A decent society should always recognise, always recognise that some people are unable to work because of physical or mental health conditions or both. And it is right that we protect the most vulnerable people in our society, and I believe that support is there. For despite some of the scaremongering and some of the sillier headlines, it's worth reflecting on the fact that in this country, we spend more on sick and disabled people than the OECD average. And it's also worth putting that in perspective. According to the OECD, the UK spends more on incapacity than France, Germany, or Japan. However, with that strong record of support for those most in need, we're also ensuring that the resources are in place to support people into work. And I'm proud that we are providing significant new funding for additional support following the budget to help claimants into work. 60 million in 2017, rising to an additional 100 million a year by 2020. And we're seeing a continued rise in the number of disabled people getting into work as a result of that. The latest figures show a rise of more than 200,000 disabled people who are now in work compared to the same time last year. That's now over 3 million disabled people who are in employment, a remarkable figure. But I believe this is only the beginning. For we know that there remains a gap between the employment rate of disabled people and non-disabled people. We want to ensure everyone has the opportunity to transform their lives for the better by getting into work. And that is why, as part of our One Nation approach, we've committed to halving that gap in employment between those who are disabled and those who are not disabled. On current figures, that means getting one million more disabled people back into work. Now, I want to be clear. This employment gap isn't because of a lack of aspiration on the part of those receiving the benefits. In fact, the majority in receipt want to work or stay in work. But I believe this gap exists because of two factors. First, <laughs> some employers are reluctant to employ people with disabilities still. And that is why we set up <clears throat> a few years ago the Disability Confident Campaign. And this shows employers that the reality is quite different from their perception about people with disabilities. In fact, that once employed, people with disabilities are in the vast majority of cases more productive than others who may be working around them. 
And that often causes businesses to stop for a second and recognize uh, that they have made a mistake. And second, the poor quality of support uh, that they receive leads too many sick and disabled people languishing in a life without work when work is actually possible for them. It is this support that I want to turn to now. I want to look at the support people receive right from the start when they first show those first signs of being sick, which can very often be from their employer. Too many businesses do not pay any attention to the health condition of an employee who has fallen ill or to make any attempt to understand what that problem is. I can understand the problems for them, but nonetheless, that is a reality. <clears throat> so the employee goes to the doctor, and after a short assessment, their doctor then signs them off work. Too often, even early on, no one at work maintains regular contact with them. And after successive sick notes, their original condition gets worse. An opportunity to keep the prospect of a return to work within sight is progressively lost. Instead, they move on to sick pay, and then at some point are left to cascade onto sickness benefit. This has become a damaging cycle, which affects everyone, not just those who then go on to sickness benefit. Instead, I believe, employers need to recognize the importance of staying in touch with their staff when they get sick, and of providing early support to someone to stay in work or to get back to work. This makes sense, I believe, for three very important reasons. First, it makes sense for a business who invests a lot of money in their staff, developing and training them, not to lose that investment through uh, long-term worklessness. We know each month a person is on uh, sickness benefit, that will be a damaging process for them. So that absence could be avoided, and that process benefits the business who's invested the money. Second, it makes sense for society by stopping people falling into expensive sickness benefits and then onto long-term worklessness. As I said, each month a person is on sickness benefits, they become progressively less likely ever to work again. And third, and I believe perhaps most importantly of all, it makes sense to ensure that a fellow human being isn't written off with all the negative consequences that follow for them and their families. Now, some companies do understand this. They realize the benefits of investing in staff health and well-being. And they've come to see that it improves productivity and reduces the cost of sickness absence. In these organizations, employers who fall sick will experience regular and direct communication. They will receive a work-focused health assessment to overcome any obstacles to a return to work and review what work they can do and what support they need to do it. And together with the employer, they will also agree a plan of action with timescales to support a return uh, to work, taking into account their health condition and any workplace adjustments. At every step in that company, that good company, there is a tailored support and a realistic expectation on both sides of a return to work. Importantly, and where possible, that vital link with work is not lost. Sadly, this is, however, by no means common practice. Other countries, I believe, having gone and seen them and talked to them, I believe, often do this better than us. And it's something that both the private and the public sector in Britain, I believe, we need to get better at. I want to spend a moment to highlight two examples that shows that it can be done, and when it's done, and done properly, it is remarkable. One from my department, and one here from Barclays. Sue Hopkins, who I was talking to earlier today, is a work capability manager at Stratford Benefit Centre. In 2010, Sue almost lost her life after brain surgery caused an infection and destroyed her optic nerve. Sue thankfully survived, but she lost her sight and was left also with epilepsy. Despite this, Sue was determined to carry on helping vulnerable people. She was supported in the workplace with both specialist equipment and a human helping hand when she needed it. This meant Sue was able to continue with the job that she loves and meant she could continue in her career, which now spans over a quarter of a century. A remarkable story. And there's Helen White, 
an IT accessibility manager here at Barclays, who again I was talking to earlier. Helen has mental illness. She describes her condition as, and I quote, an invisible illness, which has led to some difficult challenges. But Barclays, alongside Helen, have made adjustments to the way uh, that work allows her to continue in her role. From flexible working and compressed hours to time off when necessary for medical treatment. And as a result of these adjustments, Helen is getting the most out of her work. And in return, her company is getting the best from her. Sue and Helen show, I believe, that a disability does not need to be a barrier to fulfilling a career. Some of you may have examples in many of your own organizations. These are but two. Both their stories are, of course, massively inspiring. On a personal level, particularly, but there are also examples of what it takes to support someone in difficulty as well from an employer's perspective. So, if we think about those cases, we can see the personal and professional empowerment that is possible if the right support is provided at the right time. But employers can't do it alone. I recognize that. GPs are also in that process. They need to see the health benefits for the patients of early support and a return to work. The good news is that now businesses and GPs will be able to use the new fit for work service that we've been rolling out uh, at the department. So instead of asking, how sick are you? The new service asks, what help can we give you now that will help to keep you close to your job? Sophisticated early support can have a positive effect on both health and employability. And we're also working with the Department of Health so that GPs routinely send people uh, fit for work to get their return to work plan. In fact, all GP practices quite recently have been sent a letter asking them to do just that, to use the fit for work service to get that plan uh, for their patients. So we've already heard those inspiring stories uh, particularly here uh, uh, Helen at Barclays with her mental health condition. And I do want to take a moment just to have a look at what was one of the biggest causes of work absence in the UK, which is why I highlight Helen in this regard. One in six people have a common mental health condition. And you're much more likely to fall out of work if you have such a condition. In fact, almost one in four people on Job Seekers Alliance has also a mental health condition. And the vast majority are related to anxiety and depression, which we know are treatable conditions. And the sooner someone gets treatment, the better it is for them. And we know the longer you are out of work, the more chance you have of a worsening mental health condition. Even if the original reason for your ill health was a physical one, it very rapidly also becomes a mental health problem. So every day, clearly, matters in this process. And that is why our Fit for Work service includes professional experts skilled in helping people with mental health conditions. And that is why this government is investing in psychological treatment services which are framed at and are helping thousands of people return to work from a period of sickness absence. And that is why we are also investing and testing new ways of joining up health and employment services to improve access to treatment and support. So, I see the Fit for Work service as the first line of defense when someone falls sick from work, helping employers and GPs to step in earlier. But even when someone is out of work, it remains critical that we have a modern and flexible benefit system which then supports them, one that keeps them close to the labor market wherever possible. And that is what is so important about universal credit. Now, the rollout for universal credit is well underway. Half of all job centers are now using universal credit, and there are many trials going on around it, working with local authorities uh, and other local bodies, including uh, banks. However, there is a tendency of people to focus on universal credit as a technical innovation. Today, I want to explain just how transformative universal credit is in a human sense, and this has a massive bearing on what I'm announcing today. Under tax credits, once someone claims they lose any human interface with the job center, you're at the job center, you got a job, 
the job centre doesn't see you anymore now, and you navigate your way through the tax credit uh, maze. But under universal credit, people can expect early and continued support about what work they can do and what support that they need to do until they leave the benefit system. In other words, you don't leave the job centre until you leave the system. And as a result, work coaches will spend time working now with claimants, focusing them on what they need to do and how the system can help them progress both in work and in some of the other areas in which they may have difficulty. And I believe this is the core value of universal credit. It's that human interface with the advisor who through universal credit will work on their plan and help motivate them and support them in their return to independence as they work more hours uh, as they move towards that independent state. And moreover, with ESA now becoming part of universal credit, it is that access and human interface which opens the way for us to rethink the relationship between sickness benefits and work. I spoke earlier about what good employers do once one of their staff goes off sick. They keep in touch on a regular basis through a clear action plan. They look at obstacles that may be preventing that return to work uh, and do everything they can to remove them. However, what happens to a claimant uh, on employment support allowance is really very different. Under the existing system, there is a limited opportunity to work with the job centre. Instead, they receive an assessment of a condition that focuses on what they actually can't do rather than what they can do. That assessment will force them into what is a binary category, saying that they can't, that all they'll have to do is either be expected to work or that they cannot work. There is no in-between. And so it's not surprising that over the last two decades, the number of people on sickness benefit has stayed at around 2.5 million, while the number of people on unemployment-related benefit has nearly halved since 2010, a remarkable fall of some 700,000 people that were once claiming. And the number of sickness benefit claimants has in the same time fallen by around about 88,000. Employment Support Allowance was designed and introduced under the last Labour government in 2008 and expanded by Yvette Cooper, who was my immediate predecessor when she was at work and pensions. Labour said it would lead, they believe, to one million fewer people being on incapacity benefit. That, I think, was what John Hutton said in 2006. However, the design of ESA is a short-term benefit where the vast majority of people are helped to return to work simply hasn't materialised in reality as a result. ESA may well, and I believe probably was, designed with the right intentions, but I believe at its heart, we realise, lies a fundamental flaw. It is a system that decides that you are either capable of work or you are not capable of work. Two absolutes that equate to one perverse incentive. A person has to be incapable of all work or available for all work. Surely this needs to change. It doesn't reflect the nature of what is actually happening out there. And with universal credit, it doesn't reflect the nature of what we may be able to do. Someone may be able to do some work for some hours, days or weeks, but not what they were doing previously when they first became ill. And as ESA becomes part of universal credit, the two approaches right now are at odds. We need to look at the system and in particular the assessment we use for employment support allowance. The more personalised approach under universal credit that I spoke of earlier sits alongside a work capable assessment which sets the wrong incentives. That's why I want to look at changing the system so that it comes into line with the positive functioning of universal credit. A system that is better geared towards helping people prepare for work they may be capable of rather than parking them forever beyond work, which is exactly the opposite of universal credit. We need a system focused on what a claimant can do and the support that they need to be able to do it, and not just on what they can't do. That is why I've asked uh, Priti Patel, my brilliant employment minister who's here today, uh, to lead this process as part of that research. And so whether it's through fit for work, universal credit, or an improved assessment, the more that people feel there is someone with them, helping them get over the hurdles back to work and to stay in work, the more likely their lives will change for the better. I want to place people at the heart of a system 
and make the system work around them rather than the other way around, has been the case. It was this back-to-front approach <coughs> which we had inherited, a system that people crashed into and struggled to figure out too often. Over the course of the last parliament, uh, you know, the Labour Party uh, stood in opposition to all of our reforms to sort out this flawed system. Given commitments from each of the lead leadership candidates standing today about the Welfare and Reform Bill, I suspect uh, they will continue on this path uh, of blanket opposition. My challenge really to them politically today is to look at the reforms that I am proposing, which are about, I believe, transforming lives, to give everyone in this country a chance of a better life, a chance to fulfill their potential, uh, I would hope that is something we can all support and I would offer uh, to all parties that this is an opportunity to engage uh, so that we can all together find this solution. As part of the one nation approach that I spoke of earlier, I believe we are committed to continuing <coughs> to reform this system so that it travels with people through every step of their journey from dependence to independence. When we achieve that, we will finally have a welfare system that I believe is fit for the 21st century a welfare system that focuses on those most in need and helps ensure that people who can become independent from the state and live better and more fulfilled lives. Thank you very much.